All right, everybody. So welcome to the week four review video. I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I really don't have any single topics to list or explain individually. Instead, we're going to tell one big story based on the feedback that I've gotten from the Edpuzzle lectures. It's like little loose ends here and there. A lot of references to what are the GTFs slash what is DABFE, same kind of question. Some questions about mRNA processing, a lot of questions about the AP and ESAL sites of translation. And a number of you really hit the nail on the head and said you just want to kind of know this whole story. I jump around a lot, especially in the translation lecture, to try to teach it in little bits. And you wanted that big, holistic, big picture story. So that's what I'm going to give you. We're going to start with a DNA gene, and we're going to end with an expressed protein, and that's going to bring us through every single thing that we're talking about in this lecture pair as one giant story of gene expression. And I'm going to do it without notes, so off the top of my head, I'll try to tell this story as thoroughly as possible, and if I forget any facts, I'll build little pop-up uh, dialogue text boxes in the video in post-production just to cover up any loose ends. But hopefully I'll get it all right just by telling the story as I understand it in my head. So we're going to start off with a gene, right? So we're in the context of DNA. That DNA is double-stranded, so it's going 5' prime to 3' prime left to right on the top strand, 5' prime to 3' prime right to left on the bottom strand. And we're in the context of a much longer chromosome. So there's DNA going off all the way to the left, DNA going all the way to the right. And we have here a gene that we're focusing in on. Now that gene is comprised of really three main pieces, two pieces that we need to be considering here for this lecture pair. We've got our coding region or our open reading frame. That's going to be the actual instructions for building a protein. It's going to start with an ATG start codon. It's going to stop with one of the three stop codons. It's going to have DNA in between. Of course, this is all in the context of nucleic acids, but that's our gene proper. That's the coding region of the gene for making a protein. And I've only got an ATG here and a TAG here to represent the start and stop codon. Do please keep in mind, is that a little blurry? You see, my eyes are so bad I can't tell if they're blurry because I can't see or blurry because it's blurry. Anyway, um, but do know that there are bases in here, you know, there are bases everywhere. This is just long, long chains of amino, of a nucleic acid. So these are just chains of nucleotides here. We're just highlighting a few. The second component of the gene is shown right here. This is a promoter. That's the generic term for this region. Every single gene and every living cell on this planet has a promoter. This is where the gene can be turned on or turned off. This is the origin site or the initiation site of transcription. Uh, the third element, which I won't talk about or draw, we'll talk about it next week in class, are the control elements. So these are where repressors and activators will bind, usually just next to the promoter, but not always. And these are the proteins that regulate the gene, have it forced on if the cell needs that protein, turn it off if the cell doesn't need that protein. But that gets into the world of gene regulation, which is what we'll talk about next week. So what we want to concern ourselves here. Uh, is the open reading frame or coding region, the instructions for building the protein, and the promoter, where this is all going to initiate. And we also want to keep in our mind that replication and transcription are two completely different things. Too many times in this course, year after year, I will ask a transcription question at a mastery check, and a student will give me a wonderful answer and describe replication to a T, and they get zero credit for that because transcription is the copying of a single gene into messenger RNA, and replication is the copying of entire chromosomes. One involves initiator proteins, origins of replication, single-stranded binding protein, helicase, a replication fork, all of those things. And that is completely different and distinct from general transcription factors, Tata binding protein, RNA polymerase, the CTP tail, and all of that story. So we definitely want to keep those two stories distinct. They are completely different processes. All right, so back to our gene. So in eukaryotes, this promoter is an AT-rich region. And because of that, it's given an AT-rich name. We call the promoter in eukaryotes a Tata box to symbolize that those Tata boxes are composed almost primarily of thymine and adenine. 
We know why that is, right? We can infer why that is because these are the base pairs that have two hydrogen bonds. It makes it easy to pull apart the DNA at a promoter. So in that way, promoters are somewhat synonymous with origins of replication. Regions of DNA that are meant to be pulled apart tend to be rich in ATs. So we have our Tata -ta box. Step one to start this party is the assembly of the pre-initiation complex. Every single gene that's going to be transcribed in our genome requires accessory proteins called general transcription factors. They're called transcription factors because they're proteins that are required for transcription. And we put the term general here to symbolize that this is true of all genes. This is a general need. These aren't specific transcription factors that specific genes need. These are general transcription factors that all genes need. And all of these GTFs are named as transcription factor for RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 2 is the RNA polymerase that is responsible for transcribing protein coding genes. And then it gets some kind of unique designation by letter. And that acronym, DABFE, is meant to help us remember how, or in other words, the order in which these GTFs are recruited. So the first GTF is TF2D. And TF2D is unique in that it is the only GTF that binds directly to DNA. And that's because one of the many subunits of TF2D is a protein called Tata binding protein, or TBP. Now, I'm sure it's no surprise what Tata binding protein does. Tata binding protein binds to the Tata box. And because it is part of the larger protein complex of TF2D, that means TF2D is recruited first. There's the D of DABFE. The next general transcription factor that joins here is TF2A. TF2A layers upon TF2D and binds to it, but not the DNA directly. There's the A of DABFE. TF2A comes next. After TF2A comes TF2B. TF2B also binds and stabilizes the interaction between TF2D and TF2A and further stabilizes the entire assembly here. There's our B of DABFE. Now, DABFE is two syllables for a reason because the next thing that's going to come is F for sure. But F is going to be escorting the RNA polymerase itself. So TF2F comes, but it drags with it RNA polymerase 2 itself. So here is RNA polymerase 2 with its long protein tail, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so dab, break, right? Break in the syllabus. And then that F, what that means is right in here, the RNA polymerase 2 is also coming. So it's TF2D, TF2A, TF2B, TF2F with the polymerase, and then TF2E and TF2H. So I'm running out of colors. I am almost run out of colors. So DABFE, TF2E comes next. It stabilizes the recruitment of the polymerase with the rest of the complex. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, we have TF2H. For Fe. I'm going to have to make that blue as well because I am out of colors now. So there's TF2H. And there we have it. We have assembled all of the general transcription factors. Once assembled, this entire mess of complexes is referred to as the pre-initiation complex, the PIC. The pre-initiation complex is composed of all of the general transcription factors and RNA polymerase 2 stably recruited to the promoter of a gene. So we are now competent to initiate transcription. We can now have transcription start. And I want to stress, this happens at all of our genes. Anytime any one of our genes needs to fire, this has to happen. So how do we get that to happen? How do we get this to fire? Well, TF2H does double duty. It's the only one that has its letter designation to symbolize its function. TF2A and B and D and E and F, they were all named actually in the order they were discovered. So the first general transcription factor to be discovered was TF2A. It was only learned later that it's the second to be recruited. But H is given that name H because this TF2H complex has its own helicase activity. 
Now let's not confuse this with the actual protein DNA helicase that's needed in replication, but this protein does have helicase activity. It's capable of pulling DNA apart and keeping it separated. So TF2H is going to open up a transcription bubble and allow the beginning of the DNA to be single-stranded here. The second thing that TF2H does is it allows the RNA polymerase to leave this complex. It actually kickstarts RNA polymerase. This is so stable, this pre-initiation complex, that RNA polymerase actually doesn't want to leave. And so by phosphorylating this tail of RNA polymerase, TF2H disrupts or destabilizes the pre-initiation complex and releases RNA polymerase down the gene. So again, these little red X's, these are phosphorylation events. We're adding phosphate groups to amino acids that are on this tail of RNA polymerase 2. This tail is actually at the very end of the protein chain, the, the amino acid chain of RNA polymerase 2. That's the carboxy end, if you haven't had biochemistry yet. And so we call this tail the carboxy terminal domain. And that's just a complicated way of saying the region of the protein or domain that's at the end or terminal of the carboxy end. So carboxy terminal domain is the stretch of proteins or amino acids at the carboxy end of the protein. So TF2H phosphorylates that carboxy terminal domain, disrupts and destabilizes the pre-initiation complex, and now RNA polymerase 2 can travel down the gene and make a complementary RNA strand to this DNA sequence. So that's transcription initiation for eukaryotes. The actual process of transcription is, is pretty lame. It's just complementary base pairing. So uh, obviously there's going to be a T. If this is an A, this is going to be a T down here. So RNA polymerase would add an A to the RNA. The next thing though, right, we have an A down here, base paired to this T. There are no thymines in RNA, so RNA polymerase would put a uracil in that position, so it would make an mRNA that is A U G U U A G G C. So it would just make an RNA copy of this DNA sequence. Okay. So let's do that. Let's say all of that has happened, and here is our premature messenger RNA. And it's got some what are called five prime untranslated regions. It's got some sequences here upstream of the start codon, but let's just put that start codon in. And then we had, like we had said before, a bunch of other nucleotides. And then I think I had put a TAG stop codon in the previous uh, slide, slide, in the previous drawing. So that would be a UAG here. And then we have our uh, three prime untranslated region or just uh, sequences and nucleotides after the stop codon. So there is our premature messenger RNA. Now, what we don't really talk too much about in other courses, but what we need to mention here is that in eukaryotic DNA especially, there are intervening regions that lie between the codons. And those intervening regions don't code for protein. They're actually in the way. We call those introns. And they are disruptive. They don't contain codons. If we were to translate the intron, we would get a scrambled mess. And if those are introns, then the stuff that we want to keep are called exons. So part of processing this messenger RNA is going to be cutting out those introns. A protein complex called the spliceosome, which we really, really don't go into too much detail here, uh, it's going to bind kind of across or saddle this intron, that's the spliceosome. It's going to snip the intron right here at the three prime end, right where the intron and the exon boundary is at the three prime end of the intron. And then the spliceosome is going to loop this intron back on itself and get that three prime end that it just snipped to attach to an adenine that's in the middle of the intron. Every intron has one of these adenines. It's called a branch point. The spliceosome will then snip the three prime end of the intron and that structure, that kind of looped upon itself intron is then released. It's called a lariat because it has this kind of lasso shape. 
The spliceosome is then going to join these two ends of the messenger RNA, bring them together and create a new phosphodiester bond between them, and that will culminate in the end of splicing. So that's how we get our, uh, what I say, UAG? That's how we get our introns out. So that is splicing. That's one of the three things that has to be done to make a messenger RNA mature. The second thing that happens is a guanine nucleotide is put on the five prime end of the messenger RNA. So there's our guanine and it's unique in that the guanine is almost attached to the rest of the nucleotide in an upside down manner. It's a very unique guanine attachment and it's methylated. So this, what looks like a W here is really meant to be an M upside down. So I'm trying to symbolize that the guanine cap of the messenger RNA is not only attached in this kind of upside down manner, but it also has a methyl group on it. So that's the five prime end. And finally, the last step of mRNA processing is adding a poly A tail to the three prime end. Every single eukaryotic messenger RNA has a poly A tail. In other words, a stretch of adenines added to the three prime end. And now this messenger RNA is mature. Introns have been spliced out. The guanine cap is on the three prime end and the poly A tail is on the, on the, what, five, the guanine cap is on the five prime end and the poly A tail is on the three prime end. Why do this? This is a quality control check. RNA is very, very labile. It's very, very weak. And imagine that this RNA just spontaneously fractured at this point. Well, if we cover this up here, we could see that the cell might think this is a valid messenger RNA. It's fairly long. It has a cap. It has a start codon. It's got a bunch of codons. If the cell were to translate this, there would be a problem, though, because this doesn't represent the entire sequence of the protein coding region. So we don't want cells to translate this, but a cell could be easily fooled. Well, our cells would know that this is not a proper messenger RNA because it doesn't have an appropriate three prime end. No poly A tail here shows the cell that this actually isn't a whole messenger RNA. This is a fragment of a messenger RNA and it would just chew it up and recycle the nucleotides. Same thing here. If the cell were to only see this, it wouldn't be fooled because there's no cap. So our cells are programmed to know that an intact, proper, and ready to be translated messenger RNA should have a five prime cap and a three prime tail. And no messenger RNA will be, uh, well, no messenger RNA will even be allowed at the nucleus, never mind translated without those features. Interestingly, we have a cap binding protein that does what it sounds like. It binds to the three prime, uh, five prime cap. And we also have poly A binding protein. And poly A binding protein does what its name sounds like. It binds to the poly A tail. And there is a strong affinity for these two proteins for one another. In other words, cap binding protein and poly A binding protein really want to interact with each other. And when they do so, they cause the messenger RNA to circularize. And to be quite honest with you, that's what the cell is looking for in terms of knowing that a messenger RNA is ready to be translated. It's not really looking for the cap and the tail. It's looking for this circular shape because the cell, again, has been programmed to know that the only way that a messenger RNA can circularize is if cap binding protein and poly A binding protein are interacting with each other. So cap binding protein and poly A binding protein are the clasp of this um, uh, wristband creating this circular shape. And the only way cap binding protein is binding to this RNA at all is if there's a cap there. And the only way poly A binding protein is binding is if there's a poly A tail there. So if this messenger RNA is circular, then it means it's whole. It means it has a cap and a tail, which means it can be translated. So that's the mRNA processing part of the story. This fully processed mRNA, it'll even have proteins intervening in it called splice junction binding proteins that will show the cell that it has been sufficiently spliced. Each of these features will allow this messenger RNA to leave the nucleus. And leave the nucleus it will, and it will be translated in a circular form. That's hard to draw though, so I'm going to draw the messenger RNA as linear. But it is actually circular in the real world. So I'm going to have the cap there. I'm going to have the poly A tail there. Uh, cap binding protein and poly A binding protein. But these proteins would be interacting with each other, causing this to circularize.
And let's put our codons in there as well. We had an AUG. We had a bunch of other codons. And then we had the stop codon UAG. And we have other nucleotides before and after that coding region. So now this messenger RNA is competent for translation. Translation is the decoding of the nucleic acids into amino acids, truly switching from one language to another, from the language of DNA and RNA to the language of protein. To do that, we have to first initiate translation. That's going to happen through eukaryotic initiation factors, or EIFs. The way that these EIFs work in our cells is that the major players are attracted to the cap binding protein, which again makes sense because the cell knows that if there's cap binding protein, there has to be a cap, in other words, a valid and legitimate uh, five prime end of this messenger RNA. And furthermore, if you're at the cap, then you're at the beginning of the messenger RNA because the cap's at the five prime end. So it's a really nice place to start. These eukaryotic initiation factors then recruit the small subunit of the ribosome, which is what I'm drawing here, and the initiator tRNA. Now this initiator tRNA has the anticodon CAU. And you can see that that anticodon CAU, 5 prime to 3 prime, is perfectly primed to base pair to the start codon AUG, 5 prime to 3 prime. And this also has on it, this initiator tRNA, a methionine amino acid. So this thing is going to scan in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction until it encounters a codon that perfectly base pairs to this anticodon. So let's just go ahead and advance this a little bit. The small subunit would be here. And the initiator codon would be here. Remember we said this was AUG, a start codon. The anticodon is CAU, so perfect base pairing there. We've got nice three base pairs. And we had methionine sitting here. Once this has been stably established, the cell can recognize that the start codon has been found, and now the large subunit of the ribosome is going to be recruited. And the large subunit of the ribosome is going to look somewhat like this. It has three voids in it. It has a P site in the middle, an A site at its rightmost end, and an E site at its leftmost end. And we can see that these sites are perfectly situated over codons. We have the initiator tRNA is in the uh, P site right now, and we have a void in the A site, but it's lined up after this next codon. So what's going to happen is a tRNA with an anticodon that is specific to these three nucleotides is going to land in the A site, and it will be carrying its corresponding amino acid. We'll kind of talk about the genetic code in just a second. We'll go through the story here a little bit more generally. So that second tRNA enters the A site. And it is carrying its own amino acid that is specific for that codon. So whatever amino acid this codon codes for is the amino acid that that tRNA is carrying. And now the ribosome is going to do what it does best, and it's going to catalyze a peptide bond to form between these two amino acids. Now the amino acid in the P site can only be bound to, to either the previous amino acid or the tRNA it's holding on to. In other words, these two bonds cannot coexist. It can either be bound to this amino acid or this tRNA. Once this peptide bond is made, this bond here is going to be broken. Now, this A of the A site stands for amino acyl. Or to make it a little bit easier to remember, we can think of it as standing for single amino acid. In other words, any tRNA that's in the A site should only be holding on to a single amino acid. This P site, this P here, stands for peptidyl tRNA. Or to say that a little bit more simply and easy to remember, this is for tRNAs that are holding on to peptide chains, multiple amino acids. And E stands for empty. And I don't need to make that easy to remember. E means empty. 
So if we look at this right now, we see something's a little bit askew. We have an empty tRNA. In other words, we have a tRNA now that is not holding on to anything, but it's in the peptide site. That doesn't seem to line up. And we have a tRNA holding a peptide chain, but it's in the single amino acid site. So the ribosome moves spontaneously to fix this. What's going to happen is it will translocate a head by one codon length. So the small subunit will translocate, and I'll try to erase this carefully. I just want to erase the ribosome. I don't want to erase anything else, because truly nothing else moves. I think that's a pretty good job. And then the large subunit is going to translocate. Nice. And look what just happened. This is good, right? Because now our empty tRNA is in the empty site. Perfect. Our tRNA holding on to the peptide chain is in the P site. Perfect. And the A site is now open and vacant. Well, we know what happens with an open and vacant A site. We have another tRNA floating out there that's carrying its own amino acid. It has an anticodon that is specific and complementary to the codon that we see here. And so this tRNA is going to float into the A site and base pair with that codon, and it's carrying its own amino acid. Now there is a problem here. We violated another rule of the ribosome. The ribosome can only accommodate two, amino two tRNAs at a time. So as soon as this purple amino acyl tRNA enters the ribosome, this empty tRNA is going to be evicted. And now we just repeat the process again. Once these two tRNAs are present in the ribosome, the ribosome itself is going to catalyze the formation of a new peptide bond between them. But the amino acid that's in the P site can only engage in one of these bonds simultaneously. It can either have this peptide bond or this bond with the tRNA. So once that peptide bond is created, we break that bond. We are in violation of the rule again. We have an empty tRNA in the P site. It should be in the E. We have a peptide chain coming off the A site. It should be in the P. So what do we need to do? We need to translocate. So we're going to shift the small subunit forward by a codon. We're going to shift the large subunit forward by a codon. Now our empty tRNA is in the E site where it belongs. Our peptidyl tRNA is in the P site. And our A site is open. One more time. Have I done red? Well, messenger RNA is red. I'll do brown. One more time. We've got a tRNA floating out there that's been charged with a specific amino acid. It's going to base pair here. That's going to violate the rule of only two tRNAs present in one time. So we're going to evict uh, the yellow or orange tRNA. Now that we only have two tRNAs in here, we're going to create a new peptide bond. But the creation of that peptide bond is going to break this bond. Now we have that empty tRNA that goes into the E site. We'll trigger translocation again. That's going to happen again and again and again and again. Just kind of like this chug-a-chug -chug chemistry until finally we're going to position the ribosome here. So at this point, we would expect to see a peptidyl tRNA here with all of its amino acids coming off. We would have the previous tRNA that was just made empty sitting here in the E site. We've just translocated and we have an open A site. So the assumption would be that another tRNA is going to enter the A site and force the empty tRNA out. We'll just keep going. But this is a stop codon. So there actually isn't a tRNA for the stop codon. But there is a protein that kind of looks in shape like a tRNA. It has that tRNA shape. And it can make non-covalent bonds with stop codons, this protein can.
And so this protein kind of fools the ribosome and makes the ribosome think that there's a tRNA in the A site. We evict that orange tRNA from the E site now. And the ribosome tries to do what the ribosome always tries to do, which is make a peptide bond with the amino acid that's in the A site. But it can't. There is no amino acid there. So once this bond here is broken, this chain of amino acids is actually released. We have no further amino acids to add to the chain. Well, that's good because we were at stop anyway, but we fooled the ribosome here, and now the ribosome is destabilized. Since the protein has floated away, we have an empty tRNA in the P site. We have a non-tRNA in the A site. The E site is empty. This is not enough to keep the ribosome together, and so the entire ribosome dissociates. The small subunit floats off, ready to be recruited by the next EIF. The large subunit floats off, it's ready to engage in another round of translation as well. And this protein floats off as well. This protein is referred to as a release factor because it allows the ribosome to be released from translation. So that's the story of translation as well. A little bit messy, but it kind of has to be because there are so many moving parts. Uh, a few things to say about this. Firstly, Everything I've talked about here is in one giant context of gene expression. We started with a single gene lying dormant in the context of chromosomal DNA, and we initiated transcription of that gene with general transcription factors and DABFE. We talked a little bit about releasing RNA polymerase II by the phosphorylation of its carboxy terminal domain tail. We made a premature messenger RNA that we then had to cap, splice, and um, put a poly A tail on. That allowed that messenger RNA to circularize and be exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Once in the cytoplasm, that messenger RNA was grabbed by a ribosome. What recruited the ribosome was the eukaryotic initiation factors binding to the cap binding protein. That recruited the small subunit to the start codon along with the initiator tRNA carrying methionine. And then we went through this wash, rinse, repeat cycle, this chug-a-chug -chug cycle of tRNAs coming into the A site with a free amino acid, joining the peptidyl chain on the peptide bond, tra causing translocation of the ribosome, and continuing that until we reached a stop codon positioned in the A site. And then that stop codon was um, embraced by or associated with by a release factor that released the protein and destabilized the entire ribosome. Few other things to point out for those of you that are also taking biochemistry with me right now or have taken biochemistry already, we have just joined this class to that class because that chain of amino acids that we just created and released, the chain of amino acids that we've just synthesized and let go because of release factors, well, that chain of amino acids is in its primary configuration. It's just a chain of amino acids it's going to spontaneously fold into alpha helices and beta sheets due to hydrophobicity. And those secondary structures are going to further fold through loops and turns into tertiary structure and maybe even quaternary structure and then go off and do their job as an enzyme with enzyme kinetics and all that. So we have just merged with biochemistry and the life of proteins as far as that context goes. So a couple of other loose ends to tie up here before we close out the video. Uh, one, to move away from the abstract nature of just generic tRNAs coming in. Those of you that have had genetics with me, you've seen this before, and even if you've taken genetics elsewhere, you've seen this, but it's the genetic code. So this is what determines what proteins or amino acids are added. So when we encounter a codon in the messenger RNA that is cytosine, cytosine, uracil, that's going to have the anticodon on a tRNA of adenine, guanine, guanine, or AGG. AGG is going to perfectly base pair to CCU, and that AGG-containing tRNA is going to have proline on its other end. That tRNA is going to enter the A site carrying proline, and then proline will be added to the growing peptide chain. When that proline is added to that chain, that's going to create a peptidyl tRNA in the A site, which will trigger translocation. So the genetic code is really what bridges what the tRNA should be carrying in terms of amino acids to allow translation to be possible. And you will get a copy of the genetic code that you can uh, 
um, uh, confer with or, or go to for the mastery check if you need it. And additionally, by all means, you're going to be um, supplied with a genetic code for the final exam as well. The second loose end that I want to tie up is uh, alternative splicing. This is kind of a little bit of a side story that is involved in messenger RNA processing, but it did come up in some of your Edpuzzle uh, comments. So let's go back to, I've got everything is capped incorrectly. Well, not everything, I guess it's just this one. But see, I, when I do this, then I grab this, I think it's a blue marker and it's red. So here is our messenger RNA. Let's say that it has been capped and it's been tailed, but it hasn't yet been spliced. And I know earlier I just drew one intron, but that's not really realistic, especially for the human genome. Our genes are littered with introns. In fact, many of our genes are more introns than exons. So we have here interspersed elements. We've got exons that code for different regions of the protein that we're trying to make. And we've got introns that are intervening junk, stuff that we have to get rid of. Now, oftentimes, proteins will have what are called domains. Domains are locally folded regions of a protein that have a distinct function. So we might have, let's say, a DNA binding domain that's encoded by this specific exon. In other words, this exon, when translated, gives a region of a protein that is able to bind DNA. And let's just give this another example and say that this region here encodes what is often referred to as an ATPase domain. This is a region of a protein that can cleave ATP and release energy in the process. So what we can do in more complex genomes such as ours is called alternative splicing. When the spliceosome binds, let's say that we wanted to make a version of this protein that can bind DNA and do all other protein functions, but just doesn't cleave ATP. Let's say the cell has a need for a version or a form of this protein that doesn't leverage ATP energy. What can happen then, instead of splicing the way that I showed you before, the spliceosome can actually saddle the region like this. And when it cleaves the phi prime end of the, of the intron, of the exon, and when it cleaves the phi prime region of the intron, and we form that lariat, instead of just isolating that one intron, we join that five prime end of the intron to an adjacent intron. Then we're going to splice there. And the lariat we release actually contains the intervening exon. And so we've released the ATPase domain completely. And now when the spliceosome joins these two ends together, it's going to be exon 1 linked to exon 3. And we've removed exon 2 completely. Now when we translate this protein, we're only going to translate a protein that has its function and can bind DNA. It can't do anything to do with ATPA. So that's one way to splice this messenger RNA. But maybe the time comes a little bit later on in the life of this cell where now, for whatever reason, it does need that ATPase function. It needs that additional exon. And so what's going to happen there is we'll just get a spliceosome that lands here and lands here. And then each one of these introns will be spliced out individually. So we'll sever that lariat, we'll sever that lariat, we'll get rid of these introns individually, we'll join these ends and join these ends, and in this splicing form, we've kept both exons, and now we can make a protein that not only has its function and binds DNA, but also can cleave ATP as well. So that phenomenon is called alternative splicing. In other words, exons and introns can be spliced relative to one another depending on what the cell needs in terms of modality from that protein. So that's one kind of side story in all of this that we definitely wanted to hit upon. And the last side story, I believe, that we want to tell here is the wobble, the tRNA wobble. So we know 
that in RNA, A base pairs with U, with two hydrogen bonds, and G's base pair with C's, with three hydrogen bonds. But at the end of the codon, in the three end, three prime end of the codon, where there's the most room and the no most flexibility, we can also get an off kilter GU wobble. Guanine and uracil can base pair. So that allows a great deal of flexibility in terms of how many tRNAs a cell needs to make. Let me show you what I mean. So, if a cell makes a tRNA with the anticodon sequence G A A, and that is our tRNA, blown up from before, it's carrying its amino acid, and this is going 5 prime to 3 prime right to left. Undoubtedly, we can see and realize that this tRNA can bind to the codon U U C and it will deliver this amino acid to that codon so that this amino acid can be added to the growing peptide chain. But with the GU wobble in place, we now know that this same exact tRNA will also be able to recognize and bind to the codon UUU because guanines can base pair with uracil. If that's true, if we look at the genetic code, we should see that UUC and UUU code for the same amino acid because one single tRNA is delivering that amino acid there. Let's see if I'm a liar. UUU codes for phenylalanine and UUC codes for phenylalanine. See how these two are lumped together? It's because there's a single tRNA carrying phenylalanine that's binding to these two codons. Now this works a different way as well. If we put a tRNA that has U in its anticodon, and let me make that blue so the colors all line up, and let me give this some other sequence. We put that a G and a C. So the anticodon here is UGC we would expect that to recognize a codon that's G, C, A. But because G and U's can base pair, this same exact tRNA should also be able to recognize and base pair to a codon G, C, G, because U's and G's can wobble. If that's true, then the codon G, C, A and G, C, G should have the same amino acid that codes for it because one single tRNA is delivering it. Let's see if that's true. GCA is GCA calls for alanine and GCG calls for alanine. So the redundancy of the genetic code, we make such a big deal of that in genetics, the redundancy of the genetic code, this is meant to buffer us against mutations. We talk about silent mutations. You can actually have a mutation in the third position of a codon. You'll code for the same amino acid. You won't have a phenotype. This is all driven by the GU wobble. Since there are single amino acids carrying sing a single tRNAs carrying single amino acids in the cell that can recognize multiple codons, the cell doesn't need to make 61 tRNAs. The cell can make a much smaller number of tRNAs and still recognize a wide variety of codons because of this wobble. And because single tRNAs are recognizing multiple codons, the redundancy of the genetic code is actually inherent in the biochemistry of translation. Single tRNAs recognize multiple codons, meaning the same amino acid will be delivered for those codons. That's your redundancy. So that's how the wobble figures into translation, and more importantly, that's the purpose of the wobble, or the effect of the wobble on the redundancy of the genetic code. So I think that's all that I wanted to cover in this video. I actually expected this video to go much longer than 45 minutes, so I'm pleased that it went uh, as quickly as it did. That is the entire story of gene expression, from the single dormant gene sitting there waiting to be transcribed to the ultimately completed protein that's gone through all of translation. And we've hit on all of the important sub-stories in that process. Transcription initiation with the general transcription factors. mRNA processing 
translation initiation with EIFs, the process of translation elongation with P sites and A sites and E sites, and this chugga chug translocation cycle of adding amino acids to a growing peptide chain. Termination of translation through release factors, and then these two side stories that are also critically important, alternative splicing, where the cell can choose to include or remove specific protein domains from the protein it's translating by leaving out entire exons that are critical for that protein function, and the GU wobble, which allows single tRNAs to recognize multiple codons, delivering identical amino acids to multiple codons, keeping it efficient for the cell to make a limited number of tRNAs and also accounting for the um, redundancy of the genetic code, which buffers us against uh, deleterious, disadvantaging mutations. Whew. So hopefully that clears up uh, some loose ends that a lot of you were experiencing and ties all of this up into one big picture of protein synthesis. If not, or if you have any other remaining questions, you know what to do. Just let me know what those questions are in the comment box that's about to pop up, and I will respond to each of your comments individually. You can always go back into Edpuzzle, read those comments. I'm leaving you all very robust feedback on all of your video watching, so do check back into Edpuzzle to see what I've written back to you. Oftentimes, I'm trying to clarify your misconceptions right there in that comment box, and I'm, I'm leaving very detailed and personalized comments for you. So I will see you on the flip side when we talk about the challenge questions, but until then, have a great week.